This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hey everyone, welcome to Business of Architecture TV. Today we have Ben Miller with us. He's the managing partner of West Mill Capital Partners. He is a co-manager of Popularize, and he is also co-founder of Fundrise, which is a crowdsourcing platform for real estate investments and developments. So welcome to the program, Ben. Good to have you. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah. So could you just tell us a little bit about your background, sort of the path you came to get to where you're at right now, so people can get an idea of who you are? Yeah, and I really think that my background, um, it, it, my experience, everything we're doing comes directly out of, of our experience. Um, and, and our experience is, um, you know, we, we, we have a, a capital um, or financial background, worked in real estate, private equity, uh, and I've worked in venture capital, so I've worked a lot on the capital side of the business. Uh, and then in, uh, in around 2005, or, or, or th between 2003 and 2005, I really got into the real estate business, to do real estate development. And the, and the kind of development we were doing was a, a large-scale, mixed-use, uh, complex projects. Uh, our projects were usually uh, half a million square feet to a million square feet. Uh, they were, you know... Uh, um, the smallest project was $60 million, and the largest project was uh, $350 million. So they're, they're, they had a, a, a lot of um, public-private interaction. There was a huge institutional capital partners, uh, AFL-CIO, Mass Mutual, um, uh, G GMAC Commercial, which is, is, uh, was the, uh, General Motors' um, sort of financial arm. It got sold to uh, Goldman Sachs and KKR in... Um, sort of mid-2000s, but so uh, uh, that kind of real estate development uh, with a retail bent, which is, a, which is consumer centric, a uh, part of the real estate industry, is where my, I sort of cut my teeth. And then in 2009, I think it is, we, I started a, a, a smaller real estate company with my brother buying small scale neighborhood real estate. Um, yeah, coming out of the 2008 recession, uh, we all felt that that institutional institutional capital partners institutional money really it didn 't get it and uh, I mean the evidence was the complete collapse of the financial markets uh, but but anybody who has an institutional partner can speak to um, the kind of frustration if you 're trying to build a product that 's uh, more about authenticity local uh, um, maybe it 's uh, too small for them, so they, they don't. Uh, they don't the institutional capital is often about large scale, and so um, uh, every, so essentially everything we've been doing uh, since um, the 2008 recession has been sort of in in sort of uh, counterpoint to all, all the things I was doing and, and, and developing up until the 2008 recession, when everything basically the emperor's clothes. Uh, presented themselves to the, to the I think the, the to the globe really I mean the national uh, not just national collapse. <laughs> and what are the how many other I guess mid mid size um, type of developers are there that are pursuing the kind of projects that you're doing? Oh my God! I mean thousands and thousands of people. I I I I think that any any developer who is uh, um, independent. Uh, you know, let's say under the age of 50, but even, even if it's, it's not an age thing, but it, usually if you're younger, you have a lot, you're not at the same scale. Um, and in doing urban projects, and urban could be downtown uh, Sanford, Maine, or urban could be, you know, New York City. But when you're building in that kind of smart, uh, smart growth contextual environment, it takes a different skill set than building in a, uh, a cornfield. You know where I, I've done both. I mean, I've, I've, I've planned projects that are, are large scale, essentially suburban projects. And you look at suburban projects too. Even when you're building in, um, to basically the middle of nowhere with no real, you know, historic context, um, they want to they want to make it feel like it's urban, with density and 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 parking structured parking garages. So um, there maybe there's tens of thousands of developers like me. Uh, doing similar type projects around the country. 
Okay. So you were <laughs> you started to purchase these smaller properties in these emerging neighborhoods and you were doing this with what funds? Uh, a lot of personal funds and a few uh, a few friends and families, uh, the, a handful of, sort of high net worth individuals who were investing with me. Um, it's, it's, and we were buying, our properties were buying like uh, properties that were a uh, million dollars to five million dollars um, per deal, per, per acquisition. Okay. And were these catch purchases? Uh, no. Cash purchases are pretty unusual in real estate. Usually you, you have uh, uh, financing, debt financing when you're buying a property. Of, uh, unless you're buying land or, or highly distressed property, usually it's uh, you know, 65% debt, you know, plus, more or less. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so you're, you're talking about 45% equity. You would come to the project with 45% and you would be able to acquire the 65 in, or I'm sorry, 35%, I guess. 35, 65 in financing, is that yeah. how it works? Yeah, well actually in some ways your math is right because you always have to overcapitalize a deal. You have interest reserve and you have, uh, you have to have working capital and things like that. So you actually end up with, you know, uh, you have to bring more equity than just the acquisition costs to buy a um, development deal. Yeah, okay, cool. Hey, I just want to let you know your sound is coming through fine. I know you're picking up the microphone, but even yeah. when it's hanging down, it's coming through great. Okay, okay, great. So no worries. Now. You did something innovative with Popularize, so you're, you're getting these, these smaller scale developments and then Popularize happens. Tell me about that process and tell us what is Popularize. Uh, okay, so the, anybody who's ever planned or built a, a project will know this moment. And the moment is when you have a plan on the table and you are, you know, you're thinking about what your consumer wants. It might be a resident, it might be a, a, a shopper, uh, or, or it could be a worker. But you're basically trying to plan what it looks like, how, like what the layout is, what it's designed. Maybe you're trying to figure out what the tenant should be. Um, but you're, you're trying to plan a real estate project. And planning a real estate project is a lot of work that goes into a deal before it's um, sort of actually delivered. And so, um, and usually it's a handful of people around a table. So maybe it's five people, three people um, talking about what, what the answer is, what people want. How, and, and so uh, we were sitting around the room one day talking about a project in real estate. Uh, uh, so it was a um, retail building, and we were talking about what the neighborhood wanted. And my brother was saying he wanted it to be a, um, a, a, like a cool New York bohemian restaurant. And I thought he was completely off base. And so I, I, I thought everybody wanted a pizza place and something like neighborhood pizza place. And another guy wanted thought it should be like a fried chicken place of all places. He was completely wrong. So, <laughs> and I can't remember exactly how we got there, but we basically it was like, we're all sit, we're sitting here debating what people want. Why don't we ask them? Why are we trying to sort of guess at it? Is and it's called crowdsourcing. Is when you basically put a question or a task to the crowd and say like, help us help us figure this out, figure this question out, uh, help us do this work. Um, uh, you know, Wikipedia is crowdsourced encyclopedia, you know, where people, you're crowdsourcing, the crowd is writing the encyclopedia. So we said basically, how would you, we asked people, we put a big sign up on the building, it was a two or three story sign, huge black, we said, what would you build here in big letters? <laughs> and we started a website called Popularize, and the website Popularize basically lets you ask the crowd what they want, uh, or some questions, and um, and and. Part of the, I think what makes it really work is that we ask a question uh, we very visually post a picture. You post a picture of a, of, a, of, a, of a space, you post a picture of a, of a layout, you post a picture of a, a, of a design, and people respond with pictures. So that if they said they wanted um, a cheesecake factory, they would post cheesecake fa picture of cheesecake factory <laughs> rather than just writing text, which is not very compelling. Or if they, and you can communicate, I mean, not to be um, uh, cliche, but you can communicate a lot more with picture than you can with words, right? So, um, so that was the, that was basically the inspiration. It's pretty simple, kind of a simple question to ask. Why, if you're trying if you're trying to figure out what people want, why don't you ask them? I mean, and you're you're basically speaking to your future market. It sounds brilliant. Uh, I mean, it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty simple. I would say it's pretty simple. 
and it's really worked. People, if you're going to do a development deal, um, especially if you're going to change a neighborhood, it, it, anytime you're going to engage with people and affect them, it's always a good idea to have them part of the process because then you learn, you get more buy-in. Uh, uh, it's just a, it's a, and so we found lots of large-scale developments, Skanska, uh, Forest City, if you know these companies, uh, uh, Mace Ridge and, and, and Simon Property Group, big, big, big companies uh, wanting to understand what their customer wants and wanting them to be not just – it's not just an interceptor survey, though. It's not like you're asking them. It's, they're part of the process of figuring out a question. <laughs> and that's very different than, like, uh, you know, multiple choice ABC or, or, or focus group. The focus group is part of it, but they're not really in the decision-making process. They're just, you know, it's more like data. This is much more uh, of a partnership. So it's, and, it, and it's, it's been, you know, pretty successful. Now, for the first, the first project when you did that first popularized project were to reach out to the community what kind of was it difficult to get buy-in was it difficult to get people to put forth their opinions and engage them no not at all and how'd you how'd you engage them was it just the sign or what other outreach did you do to, to get your message out there about what you were doing uh, it's always it's not signage is important because you always want to do offline and online but it's also about um, blogs local blogs local a local newspaper, maybe neighborhood newspaper. Um, lot, there's lots of online Twitter, you know, Facebook. Facebook's huge, pushing it out to your. If you you have you know, you have maybe a listserv, or you want to, you you really 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 want to get it into the community that you want to talk to. Okay, so say and, say I'm a developer and I want to get my message out there, a project I'm doing, I want to use Popularize. What's my first step? to get that message out there. What would you do as, as a number one step to start getting the message out? Yeah, I mean, usually there's people in marketing departments. There's, um, you know, your developer will know who the community leaders are, who the biggest voices are, the local blogs. I mean, if you don't know who the local blogs are and who the local kind of like uh, uh, sort of people, the kind of opinion spread, you know, the people who's influencers, um, then you should go back and do some homework because it's like most people know that stuff. Um, and so that's basically, and you can go to press. There's a little, the local press will usually want to cover um, the story of kind of what people want. It's very, it's like inherently what press is about, right? Talking about what people are interested in because that's what popularizes is about. And, 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 and um, it, it, that's just to get started. And then it's, once you get started, it, it, it shares through social media, Facebook, and it, and it self-perpetuates for a while. Sure. Okay. Well, there's, as I mentioned, the pre-interview, there's, I know a bunch of architects that are currently doing developments and are developing themselves, but then there's a lot, of, a lot of other architects out there that have done architecture just design for a long time, and they want to get more engaged in the process because they, uh, they see those properties that are overlooked by the in institutional investors, and they want to, they want to get into it. So, as we were talking, you mentioned that for a person like yourself who's been doing this for 10 years or longer, it's pretty easy for you to eyeball a project when you see it and figure out if it's going to work financially. Could you walk us through that process of the things, maybe the top three things you look at when you're evaluating a piece of property, thinking about purchasing it? Yeah, yeah. And I would say that if an architect's thinking about buying a property, going into the development business themselves, go work for a developer first. <laughs> uh, I don't know how many architects I know who've really... Um, lost a lot of money by thinking the architecture is like the key to development. It's just one piece of it and there's a lot of other pieces. And so, you know, you could you could you could go by, you could go find a developer, invest as a partner, maybe a junior partner, invest with them and watch the process, uh, get into it. Because the ultimate the only way to really learn is by doing. And it's better to learn by doing uh, um, with a partner who's done it before, before you go do it yourself on your own uh, uh, as someone who maybe doesn't have experience yet. So that's just like, maybe, maybe not the sexiest recommendation, but I would definitely say um, a, a good way to start. Um, in, terms of, in terms of real estate, I mean, underwriting real estate, the th I mean, let's say the top three, first thing is what you just said. 
It's all about having a great location and saying, this is a great location. Um, and, and if you are, know the neighborhood, you know what, what's a great location because maybe between great real estate or it's on uh, great transportation infrastructure, um, whatever it is. But something is, I mean, it's obviously real estate is location-based, but it's amazing how often people, um, when they really want to do a deal, will sacrifice location in order to get a deal done. And that's a huge mistake. Because um, the great location will a lot of times solve the mistakes that happen. Because there are always big mistakes in, in development. Uh, first, the second I would say is price. I mean, I I, I came to real estate as a value, uh, really have a value uh, a bent. If you're going to buy real estate less than it costs to build it, it's less than replacement cost. So if it costs you five hundred dollars to build a new building, and you can buy an old building for that exists that maybe is in decent shape for three hundred dollars, you know. <laughs> that you should be, there should be a lot of value in what you what you purchased, and um, and so that's what I mean. Uh, and get to get a good price though it takes a lot of hustle, it takes a lot of uh, knocking on a lot of doors, um, you know, where somebody decides they want to sell, and and you and you know there's hidden value because maybe as an architect you can know there's uh, 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 extra extra space in the building where they could design it slightly bigger, so there's a lot more getting you're buying more than they realize or whatever it is. So that's price. I would say price definitely number two. Um, usually, I say my number three is really quality entrepreneur sponsor. You know where, you know if you, the best idea will will not succeed if it does not have a good leader, and the worst idea, some people leaders can just make great things happen. So I mean, it's a sponsorship. If you're the sponsor, uh, you usually think you're great. Everybody, maybe, more, maybe not. Maybe you actually. Have, maybe if you really are great, you'll think about all your flaws too, and and um, and try to manage them. So, um, everyone. Uh, I mean, I don't know, those are those are my, my usually my three: sponsorship, location, and price. Okay, good. And then when you say sponsorship, what is that? Uh, in, in the Who real is that estate, person? it's the it's the CEO. It's the CEO of a real estate uh, uh, company called the sponsor. Okay. So, would um, if an architect's looking to get into development? They would want to partner with the developer, and that person would be the sponsor. Is that how it works? Yeah, yeah, uh, and it's tough because it's hard. A lot of developers are difficult. They're difficult people. It, it, you know, it's a it's a personality type. You, you usually they have a very strong point of view. Uh, they're taking a lot of risk, um, so it can be hard to find a and, and, and it's hard to find a good partner in in any space really. Um, but uh, uh, the reason why you want to do that and why you want to have a part, you want to have do exactly that, which is find somebody to, to take the lead. In real estate, you almost always have to personally guarantee the debt. You have to basically take personal recourse on um, both the, the the original funding of the debt, completion guarantees, making sure the property is basically whatever you say is going to happen actually happens, gets open, environmental indemnities. Uh, bad boy guarantees. Um, I mean, there's just a lot. I mean, it's, it, it's like Mark Zuckerberg not guaranteeing any of the debt that, or I don't know if Facebook has debt, but I know Apple just issued issued debt. Tim Cook is not guaranteeing the debt of Apple, right? But in, in, in real estate, that's the norm, and you don't want to do that unless you know what you're doing. Because man, real estate development always goes wrong. It's not the norm for things to work out. Maybe later people will pretend that everything worked out, but it's always things going wrong. And so you want to have really deep pockets. You want to have uh, a lot of expertise. So you don't want to take those personal guarantees. Do you know what you're doing? Right, right. <laughs> and you said you've seen some architects get involved in development. What are there any common mistakes you see people with that kind of background taking when they start developing? Yeah, I mean it's tough because everybody's a product of their experience, and so. Um, uh, as an architect, you're, tra- you're really trained to think about design, think about the architecture, uh, and, and that's obviously a critical part of development. But it's only one piece of it. And and, it, and if you and as an architect, you you know you're every especially as you get older, you be, you know you become a hammer. You know you you know and, and and you're trained to be an architectural hammer. But it, it, a lot of times, that's really not the pr- the, the problem. A lot of times it's about leaseability. Can you lease a space? You know, who you have to be a great salesperson if you're going to try to lease a space. And 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 design, especially when you're doing new development, there may be no design. You're just selling the dream. And so, um, 
typical mistake architects make is overspend on design. And, and, and it's, I get it. I, I get why you, know, the, the, you see a great design and you feel like that's why the product um, succeeded. And, and it's definitely the case in some times, but other times it's, you know, it's, it's one piece of it and, and it's just a sort of like, it's almost like you really want, if you're an architect, to try to figure out maybe if your first project how to basically make architecture not matter. Your spend on it. Just try to, almost to like handicap yourself. If you're a great, if you're a great, you know, if you're a boxer and you're always lead with the left, you know, tie the left hand behind your back and 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 try to work on the on your right, because your right arm's weak. And if and and, and if you if your left arm's strong, everybody knows your left arm's strong, people will know what you're gonna do and it's gonna basically be a disadvantage. Hey, this is Enoch, and I'm gonna do something different with this episode. I've been getting a lot of downloads. I have over 10,000 downloads now with the podcast, but I'm not sure if anyone's actually listening all the way to the end. So I'm doing a test with this episode. If you reach this part of the broadcast and you hear me, the first person to respond to Enoch at businessofarchitecture.com to tell me that they've listened all the way to the end, I will send them $15 via PayPal. That will be my reward for being the first person to listen to all the way to the podcast. That'll give me an idea of who is actually how many people are listening. So once again, the email address is enoch at businessofarchitecture.com. So I know it's not much, but it should be enough to buy you lunch. And I'm going to try something new where I'm going to be breaking the episodes up into smaller bite-sized pieces and releasing them on a weekly basis. Uh, you know, I also want to get your feedback. Does that work for you? Do you prefer smaller bite-sized podcast episodes? Or would you prefer to have the complete interview in one episode? So go ahead and let me know. And once again, that address is enoch, E-N-O-C-H, at businessofarchitecture.com. Look forward to hearing from you. Well, that's it for today. If you like this video, please share it by clicking one of the share buttons. And to get updates when I post a new article, video, or podcast, visit businessofarchitecture.com, sign up for our email list, and I'll send you my exclusive ebook, Social Media for Architects. Everybody knows that you just gotta do it.